This weekend, London is bracing itself for a full-on, eye-popping retina blast of an exhibition. More than 120 works worth a combined £1.12 billion pounds have travelled the world, clocking up round trips of 8,000 miles apiece in order to be here, a Tate Modern, for one of the most anticipated shows of the year. I'm going to give you an exclusive tour of the exhibition that brings together the life's work of one of the superstars of 20th century art. A man who, in my view, is one of the most significant and influential artists of his generation. He's known as the connoisseur of the comic strip, a master of irony, a prophet of popular culture, pop art's king of cool, Roy Lichtenstein. When people think of Lichtenstein, they are thinking of the works in this room. Paintings that he created in the early 60s based on comic books. These are the cartoon works. You've got crying girls, you've got images of warfare, and of course, all of them characterised by Lichtenstein's really distinctive style. Very few colours, red, yellow, blue and thick, bold, black outlines, and of course, all of these dots, the famous Lichtenstein dot. And many of them are very funny. Why, Brad, darling, this painting is a masterpiece. My soon you'll have all of New York clamouring for your work. And of course, the irony was here, it was done in 62. Very soon, Lichtenstein did have New York clamouring for his work. He sort of became Brad. As well as all of these iconic, familiar pieces, there's so much more. We're going to get a sense of a very different style of Lichtenstein. We'll see how, throughout his career, that unmistakable Lichtenstein look was applied to so many different subjects, from sculptures to nudes. Here's a, a homage to Picasso, Monet, there's a cubist still life. Tonight, we'll also discover how he created his signature style. We'll meet those close to him. I knew Roy better than he knew himself. Reveal how 60s America shaped his work. Explore the controversy his use of comic book images provoked. I find there's something slightly dishonest about it. It seems to be doing a disservice to comic art. And examine his influence on other artists. It is one of his greatest paintings, I think. I remember the first time I saw it, it took my breath away. And we'll ask, was Lichtenstein a pop art genius? Or perhaps a one-trick wonder who had a big idea that was so powerful he could never let it go. Most people know Lichtenstein for his oversized cartoon paintings like his Sobbing Blondes and Wham! He's often called the architect of pop art, and we still see his images everywhere, in adverts for skincare products or sportswear, or even on Valentine cards and gift shops. We know when designers are doing a Lichtenstein. His style is so bold, so widely reproduced, it's immediately recognisable. You could say that he's Lichtensteinized the world, but of course he didn't arrive fully formed. Born in Manhattan in 1923, Roy Fox Lichtenstein grew up on the Upper West Side of New York. A shy but quietly determined character. He fought in the Second World War, but as a soldier. Rather than flying planes like the jet pilot heroes he'd later portray. His first marriage, producing two sons, was as emotionally volatile as the teen romance comic books he'd later draw upon. It ended in tears. Roy spent his late twenties and most of his thirties as a jobbing art teacher, churning out somewhat iffy paintings with no definite style to call his own. The art of the day was abstract expressionism, an angst-ridden, macho style ruled by the masters of gloom, Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning, who laid their tortured souls, sploshily, onto canvas with searing emotional intensity. Roy gave it a go, but his attempts were a little half-hearted in comparison. It was a 
The violence of feeling required didn't come easily to this mild-mannered man. So Lichtenstein spent the 1950s toying with the bedeviling question of what and how to paint. I don't know where I'm going, I'm on my way. I'm taking my time, but I don't know where. Looking at his early abstract expressionist works, it's hard to see the makings of a genius. One of the points of the exhibition is to demonstrate the fact that, you know, here was someone who was um, really thrashing about um, in his 20s and 30s, actually, trying to work out how to define a style for himself within um, a, an extraordinary period, actually, late 50s, early 60s, you know, post-Second World War, a lot going on at that time, and these great abstract expressionist figures like de Kooning and Pollock sort of having an overbearing presence within the New York milieu particularly. These early ones, they are so radically different. They stylistically belong to a whole different language, visual language, don't they? And that transformation seems so abrupt. When you think of all those famous cartoon images of the 60s, these feel like they were done by somebody completely a different artist altogether. The idea of showing these is to show exactly how volcanic in a way that change was. Lichtenstein's breakthrough moment came about largely thanks to a cartoon mouse. It's the 1960s. Lichtenstein is pushing 40 and yet to make it. One day, the story goes, his young son challenges him to draw something as good as a cartoon. Lichtenstein had dabbled with cartoon characters before, but only in a sketchy, expressionistic way. And then, in 1961, he came up with an extraordinary idea. He decided to paint cartoon characters simply as they appeared. He got the idea of trying, of doing one fairly straight. Oh. I did it as a kind of idea, you know, let, let's just try this. As I was painting this painting, I kind of got interested in organizing it as a painting, really, which I really hadn't intended to do to begin with. With his curious oil painting of an oversized Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse, Roy was onto something. There was no denying it. I put it up in my studio and I couldn't do any other kind of painting. Everything I did just looked like mush or something. It's just that this thing kept, you know, looking at me. Over time, the story of Look Mickey's origins has been retold. Lichtenstein later claimed that he was inspired by a bubblegum wrapper. In fact, the painting source was a page from a Walt Disney comic book from 1960. Whatever the truth of its origins, though, Look, Mickey fired the starting gun on a seriously successful career. Well, Gavin, this is it. This is Look, Mickey. To discuss Lichtenstein's breakthrough work, I'm joined by artist Gavin Turk, whose own work also draws heavily upon popular culture. The picture has all these kind of qualities that then we see later on, like the the half-tone bende dot um, and all these flat areas of single colour, strong, bold outlines. And of course a speech bubble yeah. with text in it. It looks mechanical but it is actually hand-painted throughout totally, the career. Totally hand-painted. Because this points the way, because actually when you look up close, and it's nice seeing this not in reproduction but the real thing, you can see a lot of preparatory drawing marks which have been left. Now those are things he needs to get rid of to yeah. create that impersonal pop blank look. He's literally removing himself from the frame. He, you know, he does sign this one, but later on, the signature disappears. There's a good um, theory about that, what's... which is that um, Donald Duck is a surrogate for Roy Lichtenstein. He's hooked the big one of a new pop art style. Right. And you can see, because he's looking at his reflection, and instead of reflection, you've got his and who's initials. And Mouse? He's the abstract expressionist. Oh, I see. Yeah. Can't you tell? <laughs> yeah. How important has Lichtenstein been for you as an artist? I mean, I think the thing with his work is that to get involved in appropriation was relatively new and novel. Mm. I think that now, and certainly towards the sort of, like, 
end of the 80s. Like, it's commonplace. It's just part of the way that artists work. For me, I think, the, the, in a way, like the, the most interesting element of, of this show, of this body of work, is how much he's been able to sort of remove himself from the art. And yet, when you see the work collectively, you feel him somehow. That's the great Lichtenstein paradox, but I think that's why he's very good. <laughs> it may have looked like a provocative joke, but Luke Mickey was in part a broadside against the earnest excesses of abstract expressionism. Lichtenstein wasn't the only artist stirring things up. A radical new art movement was emerging in the late 50s and early 60s. Good evening. The world of pop art. The world of film stars. The twist. Science fiction. A world which you can dismiss if you feel so inclined, of course, as being tawdry and second rate. But a world all the same, in which everybody, to some degree anyway, lives, whether we like it or not. Pop art emerged in the mid-50s, during America's post-war economic boom. I think that we're living in a society that, to a large extent, is pop. A brazen new art. It shrugged off the tragic burden of the human condition. And gorged instead on the mass-produced world filling the billboards and TV screens of a new wide-eyed generation of consumers. Ice cream. It's dealing with the images that have come about in, in the commercial world and it's using that because there are certain things about it which are impressive or um, uh, bold or something. And it's that uh, quality of the images that I'm interested in. The rules of what art could be made out of had been jettisoned. What a beautiful view. There is your first Artists broke free from the inhibiting influence of abstract expressionism by taking what one artist called the everyday crap of their lives and sticking it up on the gallery walls. The British had started it. Richard Hamilton's consumerist satires, Peter Blake's homespun paintings. But the Americans made it bigger and more daring. It was Jasper Johns's grubby painted flag. Robert Rauschenberg's even grubbier duvet. Lichtenstein declared pop art's victory in paint with his version of Popeye. The bearded villain Bluto stands or falls for abstract expressionism. And he's taking a right old smack to the chops from the pumped up sailor whose name begins with Pop. I think it's quite easy to forget today just how shocking these early pop paintings were. There was an art critic called Max Kozlov who reviewed Lichtenstein's first solo show in 1962 and he said, art galleries are being invaded by the contemptible and pinheaded style of gum chewers, bobby soxers and worse, delinquents. And just look at what delinquents like Lichtenstein were assaulting galleries with. I love the works in this room. To me, they're quite stark, monochromatic, um, but they're not particularly what Lichtenstein is popularly known for. Why are you particularly drawn to these earlier black and white works? Um, I think I like them because they're so reduced. They're not so overtly comic book, but they're very mundane objects. Um, he's amplified them, you know, but he's hand-painted them. And I think that's, I don't know, for me, they're, they're bordering on abstraction, and I really love them for that. I mean, this one, I mean, it's fantastic because he's really critiquing his own, you know, technique here and um, using the magnifying glass to amplify these dots. And, and then you can see that they're hand-painted. You know, you see the glisten of the paint and you realise that it's not a mechanical process. Why is he revealing that? Because it's strange. He, he starts using the Bende dot. This is from 63. Yes. And it's known as being, you know, he's trying to imitate mechanically reproduced imagery. And yet here he's revealing that, yeah, I do it with my own hands. Every little dot has been uh, hand-wrought. And I think that's 
you know, and he's pointing to that in a very humorous way, but, you know, compositionally it's fantastic as well. And then the fact it's these things are black and white, so they look like they've been pulled from black and white publications. Like the ball of twine over here, you know, this is obviously being culled from some, you know, trade catalogue or something, um, and it's been really, you know, blown up to, to some grand scale, um, but it's ultra mundane. I love the, the dots and the, the um, stripes. This is this idea of reducing it to an abstraction. How much have you looked to Liechtenstein for inspiration in your own work? Um, perhaps a sideward glance. Um, you know, I don't think it's been a direct influence. What about explosions? Well, of course. Now, I think perhaps he did influence me in that respect. And he distilled out the explosion as an iconic image. I think perhaps one of the first people to do that. And so I was certainly looking to that. When I did my real explosion, you know, I was thinking of this idea of the explosion and its iconography and how it's been so ubiquitous throughout centuries. And somehow he crystallised it. You know, he took it from a cartoon and made it into a 3D object. So the dots have become holes, so they cast their own shadows. And I love this idea of making the explosion into a physical object. Do you see Lichtenstein's impact on art in the second half of the 20th century? I think what he's taken somehow is the black line, because he's amplified that and made that into a, a large thing. Um, and now that black line is everywhere. You know, Gilbert and George, you know, there's all kinds of people who are using the black line. That's fascinating. So you think actually artists look at his work and go, ah, he's using this black line in a way that no one really did before. I can use that myself. Yes, and I think it's in, in, com infused throughout contemporary art. Lichtenstein was captivated by the raucous culture of America's sell, sell, sell society. And eventually, his paintings of disposable, everyday advertisements would in turn influence the sharp suited ad executives of Madison Avenue. I'm a girl, and by me that's in the 60s, Americans went big on cigarettes, alcohol, and sex. And an industry sprang into action to sell them more of it advertising. Nothing, dear. I adore being dressed in something frilly. Roy would have made a good ad man. He instinctively understood how images could be used to sell us things. It's made, in a way, partially a new landscape for us in the way of billboards and neon signs. This is the landscape that I'm interested in portraying. He was fascinated by the tactics of the industry. The secrets laid bare by charismatic ad man Don Draper in the hit TV show Mad Men. What you call love was invented by guys like me to sell nylons. Is that right? Lichtenstein got the power and efficiency of branding. He used to loiter in supermarket aisles to study packaging. And he created a series of paintings based on adverts. But his were simplified. He used to isolate his objects against expanses of dots or just empty backgrounds. And in doing so, of course, he created his own brand, Roy Lichtenstein. But it's been a two-way street. The advertising industry has pilfered the Liechtenstein brand in return. Inadvertently, he's helped to sell us everything from washing up liquid to acne cream. I'm fascinated by the way that Liechtenstein, who drew so extensively on pop culture in the 60s, is now fully reintegrated into popular culture today. And with me to discuss that, I've got the critic Paul Morley and former ad man Roger Maverty. Roger, can we start with you? Do you see Liechtenstein's impact writ large upon advertising now? I see a massive amount of advertising which rips off the Liechtenstein look and feel. I see none of it which is remotely memorable. I mean, there's almost this sort of Hall of Mirrors effect going on whereby he was imitating advertising of his own era and ad men who are not inspired now are imitating him. There's a kind of nostalgic effect going on, don't you think? I think uh, pop culture and advertisers have responded to the surface element of it and the, and the, and the way of achieving um, a very abrupt, abrupt image, a strong image, very easily, if you like. He was doing something that was a lot more troubling and, and, and profound than, than merely surface. I, I, I'm fascinated by the way that he's been reincorporated into pop culture now, so that he's, he's cannibalised popular culture. Well, I, it's I gone agree. into the realm of fine but, art, and then it's come back into pop culture. No, that, yeah. that he's made taking low art and made high art out of it, and Ad Men have 
taken high art and made low art out of it. So it's a kind of creative recycling. Was it a glory time for advertising, though, in the early 60s? Is part of the success of these paintings because the ads they were based on were somehow intrinsically very powerful? I think it goes deeper than just the advertising. At a time when the American economy was exploding after the war, advertising was incredibly powerful in driving that. It was a culture which was becoming preoccupied with consumption. And, you know, the madmen were satir satirised that set of values, and so does Liechtenstein. If you look at the banality of the pedal bin, for example, the fact that it is very banal is clearly an important part of why the image works. Liechtenstein was telling us that, in a way, pop culture actually understands and defines and describes the society it operates in better than art. Was in, a, in a funny sort of way, he was advertising himself as well. He was creating his own brand. That's the key point. Yes. He's, the brand he's creating here is not the brand of the bin or whatever that newspaper ad was for this spray can or for the ring. It's himself. And that's the great triumph of Liechtenstein. He's finding all this kind of throwaway, cliched culture his own originality. And a weird but, love but, of painting as well, yeah, oddly it, enough. It, it, was, yes. it, it's about how you look at things, but I think he is also personally very beguiled by the way the mass media were looking at things and the crudeness of reproduction where you can actually see the dots to him is not a limitation at all. It's actually part of the charm of it and he's deliberately exaggerated that. So he is rather in love with the banal and, and, and almost fetishizing it. Of course, Liechtenstein wasn't the only one experimenting with cartoons and commercial imagery in the early 60s. His new pop paintings came as a nasty surprise to another artist working in the same town at the same time. There was a real buzz around pop art in New York in the early 60s. And the dealer that every artist wanted to court was Leo Castelli. Lichtenstein had taken his work to Castelli's right-hand man, Ivan Karp. I said, I remember something like, I'm not sure you're allowed to do things like this. <laughs> Guided by the perverse principle that if you hated it, it was probably great, Castelli had a hunch that this unacceptable art was worth holding on to. One day, a little-known commercial illustrator visited the gallery and was horrified when he saw Lichtenstein's cartoon paintings. Uh, an, an artist and a friend of his came in and I took out the painting of the beach ball girl of Royce and showed it to them and they were enthralled and one of them who had a mop of grey hair and a very mottled complexion said to me, I'm doing very work, I, I'm doing work very, very, very much like this. Would you come to my studio and look at it? It was a man named Andy Warhol. Unbeknownst to each other, Warhol and Liechtenstein had both been painting cartoons at exactly the same time. But Castelli chose Liechtenstein. Warhol feared that without Castelli's patronage, he'd look like a follower. He turned his back on Superman and took up soup cans instead. So glamorous. Please do take one, ink pepper. <laughs> <laughs> so having claimed the territory for his own, Liechtenstein got going on his famous cartoon paintings, filled with soppy scenes of teen romance and the melodrama of war. In all of these paintings, he was inspired by comic books, and he shows submariners or pilots or soldiers, quite grim-faced, quite stern, in the height of combat. Here, he's thinking, he's concentrating hard on his sights and saying, this hotshot jet outfit I'm in will treat me like a vet pilot when I return from my number one wing dig with a report of target destroyed. It's all quite tongue-in-cheek, and you can see the big sound effect at the bottom, brat a tat it's almost as though, in paintings like this, he's kind of satirising gender stereotypes that you'd find in the media, as though in mid-20th century America, it was as if this was how you had to be a man. But of course, he's sending it up, it's tongue-in-cheek. And at the same time, he was working on another series called The Romance Paintings, also based on comic books, this time comics that were appealing to adolescent girls. 
They were about romance. They were about love, about women trying to find a man and back in so that they could get married. But there were lots of obstacles in the way. And the characters in Lichtenstein's paintings are the antithesis of all of those soldiers in the war paintings, because here they're very passive. They hesitate a lot, they mumble, they stumble, they sometimes leave these long pauses on the phone. They look a little bit pathetic, even if they're quite beautiful. But the similarity between them is that in both cases you have this hot subject matter, the frenzy of warfare, the passion and emotional volatility of puppy love, but a very cool and detached, almost ironic way in which those themes are painted. People often think that Lichtenstein himself seems to be a, apart from these paintings, almost invisible. But I wonder whether that's right. I suspect that if we knew more about Lichtenstein the man, we might be able to see the stamp of his personality on paintings like these. Dorothy Lichtenstein was married to Roy for nearly 30 years. She's made a special trip over from New York for the exhibition. I'm really, really thrilled to meet you because I think it's safe to say that you knew Roy Lichtenstein better than anyone. I knew Roy better than he knew himself. Ah, excellent. <laughs> well, then you are the person to talk to, for sure. Um, when did you first meet? Uh, I met Roy in 1964. I was uh, running an art gallery. We did an exhibition called The Great American Supermarket. And so we asked uh, Andy Warhol and Roy if they would put an image on a shopping bag for us instead of doing a poster. And they both agreed. And I met Roy when he came in to sign the shopping bags. I'd love to get a sense from you. I mean, we're looking here at these tremendously famous pictures he created. And I'd love to get a sense of the man behind these images. I've read that yes. he could be quite reserved and shy. Is well, he, he was reserved um, and a bit shy. Um, except when it came to his paintings, I guess. Uh, but, you know, these images of romance and war in comic books, you know, it's what Americans of a certain generation grew up. I mean, they were iconic. Roy actually didn't read comic books as a child. Didn't he? No, he was a generation just before comic books uh, became, you know, so ubiquitous, really. Very often, people say that these are quite cool, detached paintings with a level of irony. Do you think that maybe you can read them in terms of his life, your life together? I mean, well, are you sometimes the blonde that appears? Do you think? I know that people have tried well, to say I hope that in the past. So. Let me say, I mean, Roy really, really, he kind of, he really loved women. I think he was more comfortable with women. I mean, he had more women friends than he had close male friends, although he had a couple of really close male friends. And um, so I think he was in awe of women. And um, of course, he was in World War II. I mean, he was drafted toward the end of the war and was in Germany. And so, <clears throat> I mean, this idea of a war hero and a beautiful uh, woman in love, uh, isn't it every heterosexual's fantasy? Well, and, and it is, but it kind of, you know, I mean, some people say it came true in his case because there's the painting behind you, Masterpiece, oh, right. in which maybe yes. he's a sort of, it's a wish fulfillment painting in a way, but it, it did become true. He did become the successful artist who married the glamorous blonde. Well, he did. Uh, and, you know, I mean, he, even about that, he kept a sense of irony. He used to say, soon someone's going to be shaking me and saying, it's time for your pills. The whole thing would have been and a dream. Have been a, exactly, exactly. Thinking about him as, you know, the man behind the painting, often he's referencing greats of 20th century art history, Mondrian, Picasso. Did he himself put himself in the same category? Well, not publicly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. But <clears throat> I think he did. And actually, I, don't, I think every artist... No artist thinks of themselves as second tier. Um, they always think they're going to be discovered, even if it will be after death. Uh, but I think he did. And uh, I think, you know, he was kind of matching his talents with theirs. What do you feel is Lichtenstein's legacy? Well, I think he was one of the artists that 
really opened the idea of art for generations to follow. You know, to do a cartoon, I mean, even Roy said that when he first did the first cartoon painting, he had to get beyond the level of his own taste, but that also that he could not go back. I mean, once he had done that, there was no way he could go back and do what he had been doing. I mean, I think people began to think, my God, if you can paint something that looks like it came out of a comic book, well, what can't you do? People often get fixated by the noisy, attention-grabbing subject matter of Lichtenstein's paintings. In fact, it's quite easy to overlook the quiet, meticulous craftsmanship that went into making them. From the moment Lichtenstein ditched the histrionics of abstract expressionism, his marks became deliberately impersonal, cold and flat. I want to hide the record of my hand, he said, and make my painting look as if it's been programmed. Which is why he imitated the so-called Bende Dot, a commercial printing method for producing shade and depth. I was interested in dots because they had no, no sensitivity, you know, it was just this is red and this is 50% red. <laughs> it's like some sort of mathematical problem. In order to make his paintings deliberately mechanical and unpainterly, he used a stencil to apply the dots. He'd already devised an ingenious rotating easel allowing him to spin canvases to concentrate on composition without letting the subject matter get in the way. With characteristic Lichtenstein irony, his machine-like results are actually handmade. Lichtenstein always said he wanted to hide the record of his hand, but what's great about seeing his paintings up close is it's a reminder of how hand-painted they actually are. You can see where he's painted the black outline as the final part of the painting. You sense suddenly the way that the words are almost irrelevant. They're just formal components of the picture. This white and black balancing the white and black down here. And of course, one of the most distinctive things about it is the use of all of these dots. This woman looks like she has a particularly virulent skin complaint. There's rash right over her face. And it has a very particular pictorial effect. It really flattens the image, emphasizing the surface of the painting. It's deliberately absurd because, of course, there was something absurd about Lichtenstein taking a small panel from a comic strip and blowing it up into a painting this gigantic. I go through comic books looking for material which seems to hold possibilities for painting both in its visual impact and in the impact of its written message. Strictly for research, Lichtenstein poured over plenty of sappy romance weeklies and exciting adventure comics with titles like Secret Hearts and All American Men of War. I try to look for something that says something mysterious or absurd. He used to cut out panels that caught his eye from these 12 cents a pop publications, blow them up, and create huge paintings that would one day fetch tens of millions of dollars. Guess which is Roy's? Come and see. So how should we judge them? As homage to the unsung talents of comic art? What? Why did you ask that? What do you know about my image duplicator? Or plain old plagiarism? I know that my work has been accused of looking like the 
things that I copy, and it certainly does look like the things I copy. I believe I'm transforming this into something else, or at least that I'm forming art. Uh, there's no way to prove this. One man with strong views on Lichtenstein's habit of borrowing comic book imagery is Dave Gibbons, the artist behind the acclaimed graphic novel Watchmen. I really want to find out from you, Dave, what you think about this idea that Lichtenstein was accused of being a plagiarist. Mm -hmm. There was a famous article that came out, and I think the headline was, Pop Artists or Copycats? I would say copycat. In music, for instance, you know, you can't just whistle somebody else's tune or perform somebody else's tune, no matter how badly, without somehow crediting or getting payment to the original artist. Just to say, this is Wham! by Roy Lichtenstein, after Irv Novik. Well, why don't we look at some of Irv Novik's art? Because I, I've managed to pick this up. This is one of the All-American Men of War comic books. I mean, someone on the team picked this up for £5.95. Bargain. So, yeah, it is a bargain. I mean, this painting, if it ever came on the market, would be going for tens and tens of millions of pounds. Now, this is the source, yeah. right? I would say to you, Dave, that he has not only transformed it, he's seriously improved it. Um, I would disagree. Yes, I thought you might. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this to me looks flat. It's flat and abstracted to the point of view that it's, to my eyes, is confusing. Whereas the original has got a three-dimensional quality to it, it's got a spontaneity to it, it's, it's got an excitement to it and a, and a way of involving the viewer that this one lacks. For instance, the explosion here, to me, just looks like a collection of flat shapes. Whereas the explosion in the original, because there are no lines in there, because it's all left to colour, seems to have, to me, much more the quality of an explosion. I think the explosion in the original looks a bit weak and weaselly and measly and not particularly effective. For me, this, as a painting, not considered as a piece of comic book art, but as a piece of art, mm -hmm. is far more successful than if this had been reproduced and placed on a wall. For a number of reasons. He's got rid of extraneous details like the planes on either side. He's removed the mountain, which I think is an unfortunate compositional mm -hmm. device. He's made the balance of the explosion on the right and the plane much clearer. It is much more balanced. They're more equal. I think those are several compelling reasons why, formally, this is a much more successful image than the source. Well, I think there's a fundamental error in what you're saying, which is that, in fact, a comic book is not anything to do with a single image, it's to do with a series of images, and it's the images in juxtaposition to, to, to one another which give them their power. This is like a quotation, this is like three notes out of the middle of a symphony. Of course, of course, but, OK, fine, agree with that, but this we have to think of as a painting. Does it work as a piece of art in its own right, as a painting? If it simply imitated this panel here, I'm suggesting, I think that it wouldn't work as such an effective painting as in fact it does. I bet you if that Irv Novik panel was shown that size, that it would have a huge graphic power of its own and it would have a cohesiveness, which this, this to me isn't cohesive. This, to me, everything interesting about that image, which is a representation of three-dimensional space of a real event happening, this, to me, is just flattened. This, to me, looks it's like... It's abstract painting. He said he wanted to hide the record of his hand. For him, he's bouncing off a previous generation of artists, abstract painters, people like Jackson Pollock, who were all about gesture, expression. He's saying, I want it to appear flat and impersonal and mechanical, because that is the world I live in. And, in fact, that's what I want to get across. So everything you're saying, I think, in a you could argue, plays into his hands. I don't know, have I convinced you at all? I'm afraid you haven't convinced me at all. You, you know, from the point of view that I come from, I find there's something slightly dishonest about it. There's something that's kind of trying to be ironic, but I think um, it doesn't actually work. It, it seems to be doing a disservice to comic art because of that. Although Lichtenstein's work is so phenomenally popular, mm -hmm. you could argue that he's on the side of comics. Yes, I mean, I would have to agree, to, to try and find a point of, of harmony on it, that in the 60s, 70s, for a short while, the mighty Marvel Comics Group rechristened itself Marvel Pop Art Productions because stuff like this, in the, in the eyes of culture, had kind of said, hey, these aren't just comics for kids. These could be the next big artistic wave. It lasted about three or four months, I think. Be honest with me, Dave. Is there any part of you which is a bit knocked by the fact that I could buy this for £5.95, and clearly, if this ever came onto the market, it would be worth tens and tens of millions of pounds? Um, that doesn't knock me at all. I mean, this is worth, to me, far more than that. What, for real? If you offered this, you wouldn't have this. You'd, you'd take the Irv Novik original. Absolutely.
Oh. If you think Liechtenstein's pop paintings are contentious today, just imagine their impact, how strange and scandalous they must have appeared when they first landed in Britain. London, 1968. And wham! The man once described as America's worst artist comes to town for an important solo exhibition at the Tate Gallery. It's the first time the gallery has devoted a show to a living American artist. And it's packed with Brits who want to see what all the fuss is about. Two years earlier, the Tate had bought Wham for nearly £4,000, causing a bust-up between the trustees. So unsurprisingly, a whole gallery full of Lichtensteins was bound to detonate a response. The whole of this exhibition is pulling something over everybody, and judging by the average age of the people around, they're just not sophisticated enough to notice. I like the, the one looking in the mirror, because the dots are bigger, I suppose. I don't like it. Yeah, I don't like it at all. It's a comment, I suppose, on this age in which we live. And I'm not sure yet whether it's a, a very critical comment. The show was a sellout. The American who did big comics had made a massive impact. Now, Richard Morfitt, you were an assistant curator at the Tate in the 60s. It's amazing to think that this is now one of the big crowd pullers at the Tate, but when it was bought in 66, it was the cause of all this infighting. Yes, infighting not among the staff, but it seems among the trustees. The older generation found this almost completely unacceptable as a kind of art. I mean, they, they basically thought that it wasn't dealing with serious matters. It wasn't dealing with the kind of uh, humane, um, subtle preoccupations that they thought should be at the heart of art, as well as it being such outrageous subject matter. So it was, for them, it was an affront to everything that art was supposed to be? It was. I mean, I mean they, they, they thought that popular and commercial things were degraded and re really would be polluting fine art. When one met people, if you went out to supper with friends and they learnt that you worked at the Tate, they immediately, this is in 1966, raised the issue of Wham. And they said, it's outrageous that Tate should buy something which is simply uh, a clipping from a, a strip uh, comic. This was bought by the Tate in 1966. Big fuss. Had that controversy abated at all by the time of the big Liechtenstein exhibition at the Tate two years later in 68? Among certain people it had not, and, and, and it went on for years. But in fact, you know, with, within those two years, there, a huge momentum of enthusiasm for Liechtenstein's work had built up. So the exhibition was an enormous success. You know, there were kind of crowd problems. Uh, and, you know, young people in general were exhilarated by it. And his work simply took its place in, this, in the story of art, and uh, it, that was a done deal, as it were. Lichtenstein's comic book paintings are what he's most famous for, but he created them within a period of five years. He still had 30 years of his career ahead of him. Once Lichtenstein had fine-tuned his look, the hard outlines, primary colours, and lots of dots, he stuck with it. It wasn't broke, neither was he. When he waved goodbye to fighter jet pilots and sobbing girls in 1965, he looked to his future and wondered, what else can I cover in dots? He turned to the great modern masters. He did nudes. Sculpture. The idea of doing it in ceramic and in three dimensions was particularly interesting to me because to put these halftone dots and these same two dimensional symbols on an actual three dimensional surface and to make a cartooned image, the symbols of which seemed to be associated, let's say, with a flat working two dimensional surface, was something that interests me quite a bit. And brush strokes an ironic wink towards the wild emotion of abstract expressionism whose intimidating influence he'd managed to escape. And finally, 
a series of Chinese landscapes. The dots now more subtle, in a slow tonal fade, suggesting delicate mists. Sometimes people say, well, you know, he didn't change. It was always kind of like more of one line. And I really think just the opposite. I think, my gosh, look at all the different approaches he made to his work, going from very kind of uh, a modernist style uh, uh, paintings to the different uh, type of cartoon images to the two-dimensional sculptures, but a very wide variety. Lichtenstein's well known for engaging with low culture, but something that's perhaps a little less familiar is that in the early 60s when he began his comic book paintings, he also did a series that were based on art. This is a Lichtenstein version of a Picasso. He's taken his source, he's stamped it with his own identity. And in this room you can see he's done that several times. In this series, from later in the 60s, he's dealing with Monet's famous series of Rouen Cathedral. Lichtenstein called these works his idiot versions because they do seem slightly moronic, half-witted representations of beautiful other paintings. How it would be if it was reproduced endlessly, mashed up, mauled. It's almost quite aggressive. There's another idiot version painting of a Mondrian behind which lends itself a little more closely to Lichtenstein's style. But the thing is, he was much more respectful of art history than people often give him credit for. He's always fundamentally engaged with painting. He once said, the things that I have apparently parodied, I actually admire. For designer and architect Ron Arad, Lichtenstein's parodies are never straightforward. There's always more than one layer. Uh, this is, this is, look, this is like, you look at it and no one needs to tell you this is a Liechtenstein. It has all the hallmarks. This is done very late, what, like uh, in the 90s. But yet it's not as if it's a one-trick pony and it, it keeps producing the same stuff. There's always a new idea. And in this case, it's, it's, it's the reflection. I mean, we're seeing a Picasso, yes. It's difficult to read this. It's, it's a complicated to read image. Because, you know, when you go, when you see... Uh, paintings in museum and there's the reflective glass in oh, front of them. It? That's ah. what it is, that's what I think it is, but uh, of course. it's a Picasso in the frame and there's a pane of glass in front of it that disturbs us and it makes enjoyment out of, of, of the interference. The reflection is the enemy of uh, museums and galleries and uh, this is, it's not the enemy, it's, let's you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> also in this room, we've got all of the, the sculptures too. It has Picasso and it has the Cubists and it has Batiste there and, uh, and it has Liechtenstein. I feel like this is a real distillation of form. That's what he's doing. It's an interrogation, if you like, a cliche. He's saying, what is the minimum I can get away with? I don't think it's about getting away. I think he, he just felt like doing that. For me, it looks like uh, there's a, a freedom to try and experiment that he earned with his work. And all the experiments are done within a look that we grew to, to accept. And the whole thing is, has a lot of what ifs. What if, I, what if I do this? And there's no reason not to do it. And, and he does it. Is that the lesson for you, that he liberates the lesson, artists? The le yeah, the says. lesson for us is, is to do first and then think, you know, just do it. And uh, if you're interested in something, if something excites you to explore, you do it, you don't, you don't have to justify it. Personally, I think that Lichtenstein was having a lot of fun in his later work. He identified the ticks and tropes associated with a number of different styles and offered them up almost as logos. He had a lifelong interest in form. He didn't paint things, he painted style. And this offered up all sorts of mind-wrenching conundrums. Now here's a painting that I bet if you hadn't seen it before and didn't know the title, you'd be hard-pressed to guess what it is. In fact, 
It's a self-portrait. And Lichtenstein's having a bit of fun, clearly. He doesn't actually appear in the work. In place of his head, there's a mirror. There's no body. Instead, just an empty blank white T-shirt with a, a label that doesn't even have a brand name on it. So none of the great self-revelation of famous self-portraits of the past. There are no eyes which are windows onto the soul, no wrinkles or lines bespeaking crumpled experience. Instead, it's just quite flat, typical Lichtenstein. At the same time, it's a statement of identity. It seems completely anonymous, but because that style is so immediately recognizable, you know who did this. It screams Lichtenstein. For me, this paradox is at the heart of Lichtenstein's work. He's the artist who passes himself off as the invisible man, yet in doing so, he emblazons himself indelibly on the pages of art history. Roy Lichtenstein has become one of the most influential artists that America has ever produced. Take Damien Hirst's infamous million dollar dots, or Julian Opie's stark, flattened faces, Jeff Koons's cartoonish fantasies, and now a new generation including New York artist Corey Archangel, who hacked a well-known computer game to create Super Mario Clouds. Lichtenstein and his dots may have evolved from the pages of cheap commercial printing, but they also anticipated today's pixelated world. And you don't have to be an art critic to sense that the British artist Michael Craig Martin is in dialogue with his American predecessor. Michael's particularly excited by Lichtenstein's later work. It is one of his greatest paintings, I think. It, really? Oh, definitely. I remember the first time I saw it, it took my breath away because I think it's so immensely powerful. It's scale, it's confidence in the drawing, it's use of patterning. This is a great masterpiece here. So you think that this is more of a masterpiece than some of those early comic book cartoon paintings? Well, I love the, the, early, uh, the early comic book paintings and the early advertising images, uh, but I think that it's extraordinary if you, the way that he was able to take the language that exists so naturally in them and expand that language to enable him to do such a complex painting as this that's got so many different references, so many different things going on in it. I mean, there's the water lilies, which is obviously Monet's water lilies, and then we have late Jasper Johns, we have a scene of Egypt, we have a woman in a bikini. All of these different things have been drawn into that. So anybody looking at this picture, they're reminded of the language of comic strips, that he has been able to turn this language into something that's a, that allows him to touch on everything. It's a painting about paintings. It is. I think this is about as challenging a contemporary painting as you could see. I wonder whether you could try and unpick the way that he has managed to unify elements and areas that on paper shouldn't go together at all. Subtle details like this very... I keep on doing that and it's very unfortunate. You want to get into the painting, that's the problem, but you can see the orange which is used for the ashtray by the bed, which is picked up in the eye of the Jasper Johns. In a way, there's no need within the composition of the picture to have such a small object. It's a tiny object in relation. But what he's doing is he's using the object to allow himself to put a bit of orange there, which he needs in order to light, light up this spot. And if you look, within all the colors there, it's the most foreign color. There's only a little bit of it, but it's lighting up the whole area. I wonder how much Lichtenstein has been a touchstone in your work, because superficially there are similarities between you both as artists. You also use the black outline, the flat color. I think of myself as having tried to make a language which I could apply to as many different things as possible. And for me, certainly, if anything, that's the thing that I would say uh, I've taken from, from his work. When Lichtenstein died in 1997, it was the end of a career spanning half a century in which he'd created nearly 5,000 works. This is his biggest exhibition ever held in Britain 
and I think it should transform the way that many people think about him. The show is about to open to the public, but first, the critics have been allowed in to give their judgment, and I've managed to collar one of them before he escapes, Jonathan Jones, who writes for The Guardian newspaper. Jonathan, what's your take? Do you think it's any good? Well, of course it's good. It's, it's, got, it's a dazzling exhibition. He's a, he's a dazzling artist. Um, I just wonder if the dazzle, for me, um, ultimately, the dazzle is a little bit polished. It's a little bit surface and, 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 and brilliant. He takes this style, this really powerful style, um, hugely original, totally unique to him, a trademark almost. Um, and is he trapped by his style? Does he become the prisoner of it? I sort of see it the other way around, because I feel like he was a prisoner of other people's styles. He couldn't get past them in the 50s, the period when he was trying to forge his own identity. And this style that he creates liberates him. In some of the late work, don't you see a sort of freewheeling, zany, anarchic use of colour and pattern exploding and pulsating, which has so much energy, some of the energy perhaps that you're not seeing in the artist, maybe it is there in those late it's pictures. No, I, I disagree. For me, the energy, the 60s stuff is, is kind of fantastic. There's an electrical quality to them. The Ben Day dots, they don't just, they're not just dots, they actually like a fit, they hum on the wall, they fizz, and just gradually... Tails off. Away. That's what it does for me. It's witty and it's beautiful, kind of beautiful and you know, beautifully done, very witty, very succinct. And yet, I feel he's just ever so slightly intellectually lazy <laughs> and ever so slightly emotionally self-satisfied. For me, the great artists like Picasso, Picasso is worth bringing in because he makes reference a lot to Picasso and he does his versions of Picasso. And Picasso did loads of versions of other people's work and you know, it was always art about art and yet it always bites that much deeper, it bites that much harder. Maybe what I'm really saying with Lichtenstein is Roy Lichtenstein is a style rather than a man. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, that style has certainly proved lucrative. At 35 million dollars, 36 million. But Lichtenstein's paintings are about more than their price tags. They helped make modern art mainstream and 50 years after many of them were created, we still find them exhilarating. What really surprised me about this was the range of his work, and I had no idea of the other genres and styles that he'd pastiched, but in a, in a really painterly way. I would expect to see uh, the images that you see everywhere, T-shirts, tea towels, bedspreads, the whole kind of thing. It's nice to see it live, you know, so it's not just flat and boring. I was surprised by just generally how different his artwork was compared to what I thought I'd already known about him. The story of basically how he came to paint the way he did is more interesting to me as much as anything else because it's symptomatic of the time. I thought this was a show that, that really showed much more range and depth to him as an artist. What I find really exciting about this exhibition is that it's made me think about Roy Lichtenstein in an entirely new way. People sometimes assume that pop art is a bit superficial, a bit glib, but Lichtenstein wasn't a one-trick pony just ripping off cartoons and comics. Of course, his paintings, they're funny, they're bold, they're punchy, but I now realise they're also filled with all sorts of sophisticated insights and references to, to the culture around him, and also, above all, to art. It turns out that this controversial pop artist who's been so influential on advertising and design and ultimately has shaped the world around us was above all else a traditional painter whose supposedly dumb looking pictures always operate with real intelligence and wit. <laughs> 